9 a.m. in South Africa. Um, hi, everyone. I'm not sure if everyone can, can hear me. Yep. Great. We are going to need to do a little bit of housekeeping um, before we get going. Um, just to say welcome, everyone. I see we have a solid number of attendees and we've got all our panelists for this talk. Um, this is part of our Civic Tech Innovation Network um, 2020 CTIF conference, which we've now had to take um, online um, for very obvious reasons to everyone around the world. Um, perhaps before we get going, just a little bit of, of housekeeping. Um, so as a start, um, if I could just bring everyone's attention to, to everyone's screens, there's a slightly different um, platform or slightly different um, layout to what normal Zoom sometimes is. So if everyone could be sure that they've got their um, chat box open to the right, um, and in particular that um, all our attendees on the call have their Q&A, are aware where their Q&A box is. So on my screen, um, the Q&A uh, is at the bottom of the screen, bottom of the box, and it's the middle one, or certainly the one after the participants list, there's a Q&A one there. So if you could open that um, or, or be sure that you know where it is uh, for you to type any questions you have to our panelists and um, throughout the course of, of the session. To our panelists, um, yeah, we'll also just, I'll be fielding those questions as we go along. If I could also ask that at any point, if anyone's not speaking, that they could be sure to have their mics off, but I see that everyone does have their mics off at the moment or muted while they're not speaking. We also then, um, to raise a hand to speak, um, in the panel, in the, in the chat box, there is the, the option of raising a hand um, that myself, as a moderator and Geshi, whose icon is shows as Civic Tech Innovation um, Network, so has the, the, the CTIN emblem, she will be providing assistance to us. So if you have particular administrative or tech questions, if you aren't able to hear any of the speakers clearly, if you are struggling with anything, the chat box also offers you the option to directly send a private message to um, Geshi, whose, whose name appears as CT, Civic Tech Innovation in the box, and just let her know um, about any direct technical questions or any assistance that you need, just to try and avoid um, any disruptions as far as possible. And again, please feel free to capture the questions as we go, any ideas, any thoughts in the Q&A box um, for everyone. Great, so I think housekeeping is out of the way. Um, we can get closer to the meat of our session. Um, what we have today, as I said, as part of the Civic Tech um, Innovation Forum Conference 2020, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the effects of um, COVID has been the need to take uh, our conference uh, online. And I think also a great opportunity to ensure that some of what we say is issues of inclusive um, engagement and discussion and opportunities, new opportunities we can perhaps um, harness through new opportunities. So it is a time of crisis, but I'm quite excited for this particular conversation, which helps us to reflect on um, the promises that Civic Tech has made, particularly in, this, in the African context. And the session is entitled um, Civic Tech 2020. And our speakers, quite excitedly, are based in or are physically at the moment in Nairobi, in Johannesburg, in Kampala, and um, Grahamstown, where, where I am. Uh, my name is Zugi Swakota, and I'm uh, one of uh, part of the Civic Tech Innovation Network and feel very privileged to be moderating this particular conversation. Um, I'm excited to see the range of participants as well or the range of attendees and I think it does promise to be quite a rich conversation. Um, our keynote um, is Al Kags, who is based in Nairobi um, and Al is the founder of the Open Institute which is a pan-African organization in Kenya and works with different um, civil society organizations and government 
to promote open government and citizen participation. Really looking forward to what um, Al has to share with us in terms of his reflections on the promises and the hype around civic tech and where in fact we are going. Our discussants will then respond to some of Al's inputs and themselves also place on the table their experiences and what they feel is the direction that civic tech is going, um, what some of the limitations have been, um, and certainly from their own experiences, I think we have a lot to be excited about. Um, Natalie is Natalie Dakeman, who will be one of our discussants, is the CEO and co-founder of SEMA, which is based in Uganda also a civic tech enterprise that gathers real-time citizen um, data, citizen feedback, which aims to improve accountability and the quality of, of the delivery of public services, um, particularly focused on in, in East Africa. Natalie also happens to be an ambassador of the Digital Human Rights Lab, which uh, hopefully she can maybe touch on a bit to just, uh, I'm, I'm quite curious to know what, that's, what that entails. Last, but by no least means, we have um, Richard, who's the co-founder of Open Cities Lab in South Africa. Um, and Open Cities Lab is a non-profit organization um, that combines the use of action research, co-design, data science, and technology um, alongside civic engagement to enable development of inclusive um, cities and urban spaces. I think that's a, also a particularly apt um, discussion at the moment and an apt focus and vantage point. So also looking forward to Richard's um, perspectives and, and, um, and take on, on our context. So just a reminder again that um, we will have, um, I'll take us through his reflections and share his critical perspectives. Then our two discussants will follow on um, and engage with, with the keynote address and also reflect on, on their perspectives. We are missing, um, given the need to change and adapt our session, um, it does mean that we're missing two of our other speakers. One, um, Mazuba, who, would have, who is from Facebook Africa, would have joined the session um, initially or previously, um, and Delano Dutoy from the city of Cape Town. Um, but I think, if anything, um, our, we, we haven't lost out in terms of content and substance. I'm quite excited. It does mean that our panelists do have a bit more time to engage with us, so I'm excited by that. I will not spend any more time uh, taking you away from what I think is really what you are here for, for what the attendees are here for. Um, I'll open the floor to Al, directly after that, um, Natalie and Richard, and then we'll open the floor again to, to attendees. Again, please remember to keep tab of the questions, of your questions and thoughts in the Q&A box, and directly in the chat box to Geshi, if you could just, um, if you have technical difficulties, please do keep a note or make a note of those. Al, are you happy to proceed? Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, I see Al's unmuted. Okay, so I'm suspecting that Al's having a bit of a technical um, problem. I do see he's on the call. Um, I can't hear him. I'm not sure if anyone else can hear him. Perhaps what we can do, Al? Okay, I do see that others are also there. Okay, great, there we go. I'm not sure if that was all. We did do a test earlier and the sound was perfect. Can you hear? Yes, Al, we can hear you. I can hear you in bits and pieces, but you do seem to be breaking. I'm not sure um, can, why. Can, I, can yes. you hear me now? Perfect, great. Are you able to hear? Good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I, I hope that I can be heard in this. Um, but um, this is uh, it's, it's a really great pleasure for me to be here and for me to be um, joining you on this platform. I think this is probably my first 
um, online panel that I have been uh, uh, participated in. I, I'm not sure that I have. I participated in online meetings, but I don't think that I have participated in a panel before. Um, so I think the thing that I've been asked to speak about um, is uh, the question of uh, um, civic tech and maybe how it has lived up to its hype, how it has exemplified its promises, how it has responded to, to the needs um, that, that, that it promised to, to respond to. Um, by way of history, um, I currently run um, the Open Institute, but before that, um, I, 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 have a, I have a rich history working for um, the people. I have worked in government here in Kenya um, and for various other nonprofits before I joined the Open Institute. Um, and in that time, um, I have had the opportunity or the good fortune to have been involved in um, at a high level um, in British. Um, I've had the opportunity or the good fortune. I think in Kenya it started to know I am the people I have become Savannah. And in that time, um, I remember around the continent came a lot of very interesting um, I think uh, a promise to be solving a lot of um, known as very interesting problems. Um, there were tools in that time that um, were meant to solve problems like um, give people the power to um, force the government to provide high level aid services. Um, in this, I I have, I have in, in particular that were given a lot of these tools, but I know that many of you who remember me will immediately, I mean, who remember the interested, if you, can, if you can just throw them in the chat um, as I'm going. There were tools um, in, in involved getting citizens to re Report, say portals to report um, and that sort of thing. Um, there were other tools that uh, that uh, existed um, for purposes of mapping. There were tools that were built for for um, elections and so on. The idea of civic tech was was such a was such a promising one. because of the fact that everybody came from the perspective of solve problems. And so there were a lot of hackathons that were, that were put together um, for, to allow developers to build stuff that went for people. Um, there were services um, it's, um, around presenting um, those things. But on reflection, there are a number of observations that I, I Hi. Oh. Mind, high level, of course, because of the time, um, and I'm hoping that, um, and I'm hoping that. Um, Hi. Sorry to. to like, I don't remember the names. Okay. It will enable um, all of us to. Um, I, I I'm seeing that I'm seeing not quite being heard uh, by everyone. Yeah. 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 Also, um, there's a suggestion that perhaps if you could um, try and drop the call on your end and rejoin again. Um, that might be that might be workable um yeah perhaps if you could just try that and and, and see um okay so while al is doing that um I, yeah, perhaps what we could also just do in the interim is to take a few notes as we go. I have been trying to take notes of, of what he's saying just um, for the purpose of conversation. Um, in the interim, 
Geshi, I wonder while we, if we just, while we are waiting for um, Al to rejoin us, what, perhaps you could share some of the next um, sessions, which we would have done at the end of this call. I hope that won't be too disruptive. Uh, hi, Zuki. No, I'm happy to do that. Um, okay, everybody. So um, let me see if I can get this going. It's all an experiment. Um, so we have other sessions like this that are going to be coming up. I'm just going to share my screen just now with you to um, talk about what the next ones will be. Uh, let's see how this works. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen. And uh, so today is the session with Al. Hopefully we'll have him rejoin us just now. Uh, and if this works, uh, tomorrow morning we'll have at the same time uh, a second session. Sorry, these I guess are just flying through. But a second session with Craig Wing, who's a futurist. Uh, and he'll be talking to us about uh, how convenings like this and hopefully without tech problems uh, continue or change possibly into the future in uh, times of COVID-19, but also pandemics in general and uh, many other changes in the world, including what tech allows us to do. Uh, and then also tomorrow at 12 noon, we have a session where Audrey Tang from Taiwan, she's a digital minister, and uh, Leslie Williams, who's the CEO of Timolohong, will be uh, speaking about the civic tech ecosystems and how we strengthen those. Uh, and the respondents on those sessions will be Koketso Moeti, uh, Richard Jeeves, uh, no, sorry, that's the wrong, that's Tiani Gonyama and, uh, uh, um, uh, and Zine, who's from Women in ICT. So that's what we've got coming up. I'll just stop there, Zuki. I think Al might be back and we can see whether that's better now. Great, thanks so much, Geshi, thanks for that. Al, are you back with us? I do see there does appear to be two um, profiles for Al on the call. I wonder if that not, might, might not be part of the problem. Um, Al, do you want to resume? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. Just checking. Can, can I be heard? Yes, so much better. Oh, good. good. Um, I suppose there's uh, something to be said for technology in, in all of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, I, I have no idea where I was, so if you if you don't mind yeah. all these interruptions, I'm just gonna basically go wherever I was, and then we can go into questions afterwards. Yeah, is that okay? Perfect. Yes. Thanks. So, um, so I, I think I was saying that um, when 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 I when when I remember that this this sort of thing started around 2005, um, civic tech, I mean. And I remember that at that time, it was so, we were all filled with a lot of promise. We all believed that technology can be used to solve uh, problems and in particular, it can be used to bring citizens and government way closer together and get them to sort of um, uh, uh, force the government's hand in, in providing services, especially in Africa where governments uh, were not providing services and where governments were not um, achieving um, the goals that, uh, that the people wanted. But in that, um, in that promise um, lay a couple of things that, that then I want to make um, known is that my own observations, and, and, I, and, and I'm willing to hear what everybody else has to say about this, but my own observations is that number one is that a lot of civic tech in that time was driven by donors. We saw um, that, you know, um, when, where donors had um, a lot of um, drive around um, supporting civic tech engagements. We saw um, a lot of um, hackathons then um, costing $500,000. I remember attending a hackathon um, that had about 150 uh, developers, but um, that was funded for about half a million shilling, half a million dollars. Um, I saw tools um, that, that were built in that time that uh, were funded up to three, four million dollars um, for web tools. Um, I saw a lot of wastage. I saw, um, you know, developers being flown up and down and that sort of thing. And I remember that by 2010, 2011, 2012, um, they started having, we started having conversations around 
okay, so we're building all of these tools, we're building all of these things, but the one thing that we're not seeing is that we're not seeing usage. Uh, we're not seeing people being aware of them. And uh, this now led to um, the, the hype part of it. As, as skepticism of the tools grew, we started to see a little more hype, um, a little more hype um, uh, arising out of uh, a lot of this uh, tool, uh, you know, sort of tools. I remember, let me give you a couple of examples. I remember um, being involved in building uh, an election tool. Um, that was meant to um, just show people where um, where um, voting centers were. It was a simple web tool that allowed you to go on it and find your your voting station, uh, which station you're supposed to be voting at, and then you go and vote. I then saw um, a conference at a conference thereafter a presentation made by the guys who owned it. Um, where a claim was made that lots and lots of people um, came into the election and it, they had a picture of, of lines and lines and lines of people um, lining up to vote and said that people came out because of this tool that we have built. I have seen in conferences claims being made of um, healthcare being made significantly better because of the fact that we've built a mobile app. Um, and that sort of thing. And then when you check on the usage of the mobile app or the downloads of the mobile app, you find that it was downloaded by 500 people, um, you know, and, and 400 and, and maybe 100 of those downloads were, you know, people who worked on the, on the thing or people who funded it and so on and so forth. Now, over time, uh, all of this has come to a, to, to, to a place where we can, I think having gone through 25 or so years of this thing, we, or 20 years of this thing, we can then go back and try to think about, so what does this mean for us? Number one is that I noticed that civic tech has um, done some stuff in reinforcing um, injustices. For example, um, where data is concerned, we are noticing that um, data is, is becoming the, the new tool for hegemony, so to speak. It is in the hands of a few people, um, a few companies especially, and most of it is excluding the people that um, it affects. Much of the data that is currently collected, including the data that is collected by a lot of the apps and tools that are, are being done, um, much of that data is inaccessible to, um, uh, to people. Um, the data is not even where it is made available. Um, the data is not presented in ways that you know ordinary people or um, low tech people can pick it up and and use it in some way or can understand it in some way. And that danger is now growing because of the fact that as technology is moving, um, civic tech is also moving to adapt to uh, new technological advances. So yes, AI is is picking up momentum now. Um, bio data such as uh, facial recognition and so on are picking up momentum right now and all of these things have a serious danger in terms of um, excluding um, the very people who are providing data um, for it um, and this is something that um, I think we all have to pay some attention to. Now when donors who are the biggest drivers of civic tech um, left. Um, for example, when donors said that they, they are no longer um, funding um, hackathons anymore, hackathons die down to a trickle. We, we don't see hackathons as often as we, as we used to at, at one point. Um, the fact that um, Africa's civic tech revolution is driven so much by um, donors who mostly are foreign is something that we need to um, sort of begin to pay attention to and to begin to think about um, how, how uh, we begin to solve these problems. Now, um, in effect, um, the sustainability of a lot of the civic tech activities um, has had some challenges um, because many died when, when um, funding died, for example. Um, so we have a lot of the, the tools and the initiatives that were built in say between 2000 and, and 2010 um, that do not exist now. Um, 
for one reason or another, but mostly it's because of funding. And others which continue to survive today um, commercialized. They, they developed a commercial model. But that commercial model then lent itself to even further exclude people from its use. Um, I was thinking during this time of, uh, of COVID-19 about uh, Ushahidi. Um, and when I went to the Ushahidi website, I found that, um, you know, in fact, uh, Ushahidi is now uh, is a commercial uh, is a commercial tool. Um, I have seen that they have waived their their, their fees um, for purposes of um, using um, for purposes of COVID nineteen. But then, because of the fact that I think for a lot of uh, people, um, Ushahidi sort of moved away from the front of mind. So. It's one of those things that people then are not thinking about because of the fact that people will say, I can't afford it, and so on and so forth. Um, going forward, I think we have, we have a couple of things that we, we have a couple of, of things that we probably need to think about, and I, and I hope to discuss this with you. Number one, we have, there's a case that we have to make for rebuilding faith in civic tech, but in Africa. A very big part of rebuilding that faith is that civic tech has to be built with the users in mind. I know this is something that has been said over and over and over again, but those of us who have been working on this for a long time then recognize the fact that a lot of it has, has had to do with um, the next conference presentation. Um, there is a case for us to actually do civic tech for civic tech's uh, sake for us to do it for purposes of the people, which means that the question of scale should, should be a secondary conversation. You see, a lot of donors, when they are funding these things, they are thinking about how replicable this tool is going to be in so many other places. And the fact of the matter is, um, at the Open Institute, we have learned, um, I think in 2015, that um, no two villages are the same and context matters. If I am building something for Nairobi, um, chances are that even here in Kenya, that tool will not be necessarily um, useful or valuable in Mombasa, which is um, within the same uh, jurisdiction, or even in Machakos, which is the city that is neighboring Nairobi. Um, it is important that then we begin to think about scaling in, adding new uh, value and adding new qualities to civic tech, um, I think that civic tech is most useful when it is local or hyper-local, when it is going to serve the specific needs of a small, specific group of people, rather than when it is trying to solve. It is true that some of the, the, the tech will um, surpass the country's borders. Um, it is true that some of it will even be replicable in South America and in Asia and in other places. But most important, I think, is we need to probably think about how um, civic tech can be useful to very specific people and be okay with it not scaling up, but finding ways to scale it in. And then the other thing is, I think there's a case for us to understand the life cycle of, of civic tech, um, the life cycle of the tools and the, the initiatives that we build. Some of them are meant to actually have a short, a short uh, shelf life and I think we probably need to start being okay with that. Um, in, the in the area of 2012, 20, um, I think this is the final point I'll make for, for us to have conversation. But in the area of 2012, uh, a, a, a buzz phrase came up, uh, closing the feedback loop. Um, the idea behind this uh, phrase was, um, what you built this tool, um, uh, it, it is available to work, can you get to the people who it is meant to, to actually uh, contribute to it and to say something about it? Um, I think this, that value is still, um, is still um, a real value that, that we should uh, anticipate. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, we should continue to, to aspire to and, to and to anticipate its use um, because citizen feedback is going to be um, the, the real sort of driving force. Um, behind civic tech. 
Um, finally, I think the one thing that that uh, you know should be an articulated value system from the civic tech community is this: no hype. Let us uh, not overclaim um, the the thing. I mean, we all fall in love with the things that we build, but let's not overclaim the impact that those things um, have, and let's not um, uh, over overclaim the the impact that it has, so that then it it can it can it can sort of have the real impact that it does. When we built we built a tool um, in Nakuru, we, we went and collected data with citizens. Um, and what we were really trying to do is to see whether citizens themselves can solve their own problems with technology and what is that form of technology that we can do. Um, so we went, we sat with them with, with citizen-generated data. We built a simple uh, dashboard, very simple. Um, the citizens told us, dashboard does not work for us. So we printed out the visualizations on the dashboard and put them up on a wall. Citizens looked at it and said, ah, so the data is saying we need a hospital. So then they went and engaged the government and they got a hospital. In some cases, that is the level at which um, civic tech would be useful to actually collect data, to only do the back end of digitizing that data, of analyzing that data, and then go back low tech um, in terms of printing out the 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 um, visualizations of that data so that citizens can make the decisions. Um, we need to then be very clear about what uh, civic tech can do and what it cannot do. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks very much, Al. That was, that was great. And I think it's exactly the kind of input that um, I'm sure each of us was looking forward to. Um, I do note that there is already one question from Isaac in the Q&A and just a reminder to everyone to please make sure that you collect your questions. I'm going to take it straight um, to um, Natalie now. Um, we, won't, we won't break up the, the speakers, so we'll go to Natalie, straight to Richard, and then open up the floor. I will have to be quite strict with everyone, so please be sure that you do have your questions in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Al. Natalie. Hello everyone, thank you Sukiswa. Am I, um, can everyone hear me well? I can yes. hear you clearly. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I will not put on my camera for now, but I will share my screen um, so people can kind of see what I'm gonna say. I'm very happy to hear Elle's um, yeah, presentation because it really aligns a lot with what I was gonna say and with what Sema is doing. Um, let me just first share the screen. I am here. Okay. Can everyone see this or not yet? We see it, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, Sema, I, I was going to talk a little bit more about what Sema does in line with what I'll just uh, presented about civic tech. Um, uh, we've started SEMA as an initiative that kind of responds to all of these issues that already um, I'm not sure if it's just my problem or if Natalie is breaking up and has gone silent. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there yeah. you're back. I'm not sure what happened, but you're back. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah, all right. So, um, Sema kind of um, came out of the idea of what I already discussed, that some of um, high-tech solutions are maybe not really working for many people, so that's what I wanted to briefly present. Um, so in Uganda, in particular, there's a lot of uh, bribery incidents, uh, incidences when people uh, access public services. So this was actually the starting point for what SEMA was going to do, um, trying to improve public service delivery because for many people currently it doesn't really work and many people pay bribes, um, as probably is the case in South Africa as well and in many other places around the African continent. Um, and so when we looked at what kind of solutions we could come up with for this problem, we, we went over the same steps that I already shared. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, 
the idea that there were already platforms that would encourage people to report. Um, Ushahidi was also one of those platforms where people could report about incidences of violence, maybe not corruption, but um, other types of incidences. Um, and so I paid a bribe is a very famous platform that I think many of us know. Um, oh, I'm going a bit too fast. Um, but it also was introduced in Kenya, as Al probably already knows as well. So the I paid a, a bribe platform there failed um, because it was online and many people could not really, weren't really willing to report bribes online um, or use um, their 3G or their, their mobile money for it. So we felt like, okay, if people are to report bribery and if we want to have many incidences being reported, we need to make it cheaper and low tech. Um, and so we also looked at data vis visualization, exactly what I already pointed out. Um, how do you make it understandable for low tech people? What the data is really telling us um, and where people are presenting on, um, on corruption. And so there are also really great examples like budget and evidence and methods lab that do a great job at visualizing um, um, different types of budgets and, and, and data. Uh, online and sharing it on social media. So we looked at all these best examples and um, there's also this program that was run, um, a big funding program called Making All Voices Count, was funded by HIVOS Oxfam um, and it funded a lot of projects um, that failed as well. So there were a few key lessons from this that we took up and some of them were around citizens <clears throat> the question of citizens being willing and able to give voice and that really relates to the idea of low tech using low tech and then the government willingness to actually respond to that data and to the issues that citizens are raising so closing that feedback loop and letting them also include uh, be part of that um, process but then also looking at the design of those two um, and so SEMA kind of came out of this idea and um, when we went to public offices and we asked citizens about giving feedback, we realized most of them were only willing to give feedback in person or when it was very easy for them to do so and not even through a mobile uh, phone. And so our solution came up when uh, the idea of using rating devices, um, as you can see here on the left. So we developed our own rating devices, which already work in many parts of the world at airports, at different stations. It's usually a private company that offers them and uses them. Um, but we felt, why don't we use these in public stations? Why don't we use them um, at police stations or at municipality offices? And so we started implementing these devices, but also continuing to do in-person interviews, so the qualitative interviews through a network of volunteers um, that stand at the exits of public offices for a few hours a week and, and ask citizens about their experience, how, why they press happy or not, um, and, and what they would want to see improved at that station. And then of course the question of vis visualization of data came up and so we decided to um, present the information in very easy to understand feedback reports like the one you see here, um, which is basically a one pager um, that each station receives every month and that shows exactly how they performed, what citizens thought of their experience, what could be improved, how many people gave feedback, um, uh, what kind of issues came up. And so what we see is that we, by now we've distributed over 150 of these reports um, to different public offices and they actually use them in their team meetings. They use them to pin them up on their notice boards and citizens can actually see what, um, yeah, how, how they've been rated, how the station has been rated. And so the combination of this very low key data feedback collection that allows thousands of citizens to give feedback and making it very easy and understandable for public servants to understand the data but also for citizens is really what is at the core of our solution of what SEMA has been doing. Um, so just I don't want to take too much of your time but I think my main point in, in light of the let's say bigger discussion about civic tech is that I feel we should also um, leverage on these kind of gamification techniques. So I think one of them is not shaming 
uh, malfunctioning services, but awarding integrity. A good example is Integrity Idol, which has also been introduced in South Africa. I don't know if any of you know, know this program, but every a month, a different public officer is um, introduced and people can vote for their favorite um, public officer in the country. And it's been actually very popular. Millions of people are voting for their favorite public officers. And it shows a good example of what is um, good public service. And so we've also been doing this. So we are now awarding best performing stations each year and they get a small award to improve something about their office, repaint it or something of the kind. So I think kind of trying to play, let people play um, with um, these new technologies or even if they're low tech, making people wanting to improve is what is at the heart of this kind of gamification technique. So it leverages on people natural desires of socializing and competition and trying to, um, to win rewards to actually do something. Um, and so what we see is other kind of innovations um, are coming up that are playing games where people learn about bribery or about, um, yeah, a different kind of um, social or public service issues through a game, through playing a game. Um, I think Uber is a really good example of how rating systems can also hold people accountable. So we all know that if you give a very low rating to your Uber driver, if they drop below a certain rating, they will no longer be able to participate um, or to be an Uber driver at all. And so the idea is that they're held accountable towards their users. And that's also what SEMA is trying to do with our feedback devices. So the moment that people are really giving low ratings to a public institution, um, we notify them and we also notify the headquarters that they should really improve on their service delivery. And it makes it more interesting for these public officers, but also for citizens to engage with such a tool that is very low key. Um, so yeah, I think I have some other information still about um, aesthetics and how I feel visualization can also improve civic tech, but I've been going way over my time. So I yeah. feel maybe we should just um, leave it up for questions from, from now on. Great. Thanks, Natalie. That was really, really rich input as well. Um, straight to Richard. I'm just mindful of time and I'm noting also the, the questions. Um, yeah, Richard, do you want to? Thanks, Natalie, for that. And it's, You're welcome. Um, have your input. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, but just to say, ah, interesting. Um, just to say hi to everybody, um, it's nice. That was very strange. It looks like we lost Richard, um, just as he was saying it was nice to be on the call. Um, let's see if he joins us back. I think he might have left the meeting in error. Um, there we go. I think we've got Richard back. Hi, Richard. Well, there's nothing quite like crashing as you start. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah. Um, I just want to check now. Can you see my screen, everybody? Yes, thank you. Can see it. Okay, brilliant. All right. So, yeah, my name is uh, Richard Givers. I am the founder and director of Open Cities Lab. Um, and we work a lot within um, urban spaces, trying to understand how to create evidence-based decision-making, um, build participatory democracy, and um, just generally uh, try to work within the city frame, or, and really that means cities and towns and urban space, um, so that we can um, try to build a, a democracy that is citizen driven and, and inclusive. I just think it's really great to be positioned here um, with uh, having Al and Natalie haven't spoken. I think there's a lot of alignment there. A couple of key points uh, on my presentation, there is a bit.ly link. If you follow that bit.ly link, which is on all the slides, you can get to my slides. Um, there's a lot of links in my slides that um, won't, I'm not going to be able to go through everything uh, in, in the time we have. Um, so I just encourage you to take down that bit.ly forward slash OCL CTI in 2020 um, and you'll be able to get to these. Um, 
so I think, I mean, to start off with my context, coming from South Africa, coming from an urban frame, and just the journey that we've been on, um, I think that uh, we certainly started out, we were called Open Data Durban back in 2015 when we started, and we were um, very techno-optimist, open data optimist, um, and we're the first city-focused open data platform in Africa, I believe. Um, and had a very strong sense that cities were the frame for impact. I think talking to what Al was saying and, and even to what Natalie was saying, I mean, one of the challenges with civic tech has been that it has been um, multinational or international or um, regional. And even at a national level, things get aggregated up to complexity, to, to, to lose complexity and uniqueness. And that really is a challenge for impact. So we've had some um, really good uh, I think there have been some really good progress in the South African ecosystem. This is not an entire list of everything that's been going on, but certainly from my perspective, you know, we've been working with South African Cities Network on a project called SCODA, um, which is the South African uh, Cities Open Data Almanac for the last probably four years. And we're really starting to see a, a very encouraging um, progress in terms of bringing cities into a space where they are in, in, engaging with data engaging with evidence-based decision making, starting to understand how to unlock and work behind the lines um, to, to, to get the way that they operate more efficient and, 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 and data-driven. And we're starting to see cities take the initiative. We've had our first city launch of a platform called Edge, which is part of the SCOTA project, project and allows any kind of internal city, but also citizens, businesses, organizations to access data. Um, data stories, insights and dashboards and all sorts of stuff all being driven by the city, which is very exciting. I'm part of a collaborative called the Future Cities South Africa program, which is being done with uh, the UK Foreign Office and in collaboration with the metros of Johannesburg, Cape Town and Durban. And there's really exciting stuff happening there. It's a three year program where, uh, for example, we're assisting Cape Town implement their data strategy. We're building a, a system for informal settlements where across the whole ecosystem inside and outside the city, there can be information management and starting to address that really key topic. Um, there's been a lot of m movement by National Treasury in the space. Um, there is a sort of lagging, but movement on by the national, in the national scene of, of, of open data portal. We know the sort of seminal civic tech in South Africa tool called WASIMAP, which is a collaboration of uh, Media Monitoring Africa and Open Up. And then I think also what, what we are really interested in is apart from working behind the lines with cities, I mean, we typically work within three spaces, which is empowering citizens, capacitating government, and then trying to build a trust and accountability in civic space. And, you know, actually we, we you know, some of the projects listed there, like Check It, is a, is a platform actually built on Oshayidi, um, where uh, we, can, we work with citizen monitors in informal settlements to check up on wash facilities, and this gets incorporated into the way that the city, and then the moment the pilots are in Cape Town, are able to monitor how service delivery is happening in informal settlements and sort of start to move the needle and change the dialogue from metrics that sort of speak to taps installed to taps working, for example, and things that matter a lot more. Working quite a lot with research organizations like the Urban Future Center in Durban on the Narratives of Home project, which really starts to look at what causes people in informal or low income housing in urban spaces to attach dignity and a sense of social cohesion um, to their home space and, 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 and what, build, what builds community and, and what doesn't. Because I think what's been a real challenge, and I mean, I think it speaks to some of the dynamics that Natalie and I were talking about, is that um, for one, uh, there is a lot of need for capacity building inside the space, especially within CSOs, especially within communities, especially within government. And a lot of the civic tech, I think the, the optimistic ideas behind it, as I was talking about, was not so much that they were bad ideas, but that um, we, we focused way too much on the tech and too, too little on the people. So I'm going to move on because I think I'm already out of time. Um, but I think when we got to um, a, a point in our kind of organizational progress and in the, the work we've been doing with partners, that we realized that there were a lot of things that were coming out of the space. And I think even in 2015, 2016, some of the lessons that I was speaking about hadn't been learned. And there's been a lot of, especially within the urban space, a lot of talk of smart cities and smart. Um, but it's quite clear that this is about technology and not people. You know, a lot of people were saying openness was what we need to go for. And, and there's a huge propon proponent of open. 
realizing that the moves made towards opening doesn't equal equality. And there is a lot of work that needs to be done once something is open to try and bridge the uh, discrimination um, inclusion, inclusion gap. And that there has to be an over focus on those that are excluded or without or vulnerable to create for openness to create equality. Uh, I think what I'll strongly spoke about and as well as um, Natalie was the fact that tech does not lead to participation. And I think, you know, one of the things we're finding is as this kind of became a, a, a frame for us to form a path for what we're doing in the space, we were realizing that you have to meet people where they are. And the tech that is the right tech is the tech that people use. The tech that the right tech is the tech that can access uh, and the tech that will make a difference. It doesn't matter what you think the right solution is. And I think for that's really interesting as we see as we work with communities, as we work with government, as we work with CSOs, quite often um, low tech or, or you know, paper, radio, uh, WhatsApp have, are the right channels to go on. And it's not some sort of sexy app um, and it, you can't sort of generate a lot of like uh, necessarily tech buzz around it. But really, what are you trying to drive for? Um, there and then I think also the fact that we were working quite a lot in the knowledge space. I mean, we typically call ourselves um, civic data science rather than civic tech, and are more in in a space of active and um, co-design and participation, and that's in that kind of building um, the access to knowledge that should lead to change. There is a lot of things that are in between opening access to information and getting some sort of impact out of it. So I think, I mean, you know, we're in the space and trying to respond quickly and sort of sum up very quickly. We're in a space right now where I think the, the scene has been said very well by all that there was a lot of optimism that has been potentially like um, led to quite a bit of fatigue. I think we're in a space where privacy and personal data information, um, the fears around AI, discrimination and a large, uh, probably an extending digital divide are the space we're working in as civic tech organizations. Um, you're obviously seeing a need to combat the, the rise of misinformation and the dynamics that popular, populism is playing in democracy. Of course, COVID-19, I mean, we, we're gonna talk about this a lot tomorrow, but I mean, a lot of what we're suggesting requires meeting people where they are, and often that's in person. And so I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, dynamics around how are we going to do meaningful engagement and co-design and reach people that don't have access uh, to technology with the space. I think there's been a lot around the development and maturity and also potentially move away from an open source model, which is something we can talk about maybe outside of this, um, but there is a lot of dynamics there. I mean, to talk to our experience with Ushaidi, we were able to take the source code because it's open and create a platform, but that is only because we are technologists and data scientists and others. So as I'll say, is this, this is not a platform that necessarily someone can use without a lot of skill and experience. Um, and so I think, but I also wanna just talk very much about the main frame that I care about, that, which is capacity and literacy and resources. Because quite frankly, we've had quite a lot of pilotitis and projects that have very good intention, whether it's getting people to vote or getting citizen engagement. But it really doesn't matter if you can generate 50,000 responses on Facebook or something else to government on a budget issue, on, a, on something else around participatory planning. If government doesn't have the capacity behind the line to actually um, curate 30,000 unique views and be able to take that into the way they do planning. And so I think, you know, in terms of where we're needing to go for this year, I think there has been a lot of, as Al says, a lot of um, projects and things that have been happening, but there's definitely been a lot of momentum gathering in the space. And despite the fact that there are, there are challenges, I think, you know, there are a lot of wins. There are a lot of national uh, government, national CSO, local CSO, um, city-based initiatives that are starting to mature, starting to gain momentum. And so I think we need to really crowd in a lot of this in the space. I think for us, we almost, we almost use technology as a Trojan horse to get in and do capacity building. And so if people are coming and wanting a dashboard or a, a tool or something, that's great. Um, really use that as a way to deliver what they need. But you know what, what most, I, I would say, contexts need in South Africa is capacity building and literacy development. And so think about that as the main push as you go into your tech project. It's certainly what we do. The work we do as cities is mostly concerned with how we can un, like, un, build up people, build up process, um, break down silos and get these things happening embedded inside the organizations like a CSO or government 
So that the tech, you know, is rather just a respondent than a, a leader. Um, I think I really like the idea of the local focus on local context and context and uniqueness and the focus on people. I think that's been spoken about. We don't need to do. I mean, the process because we are in the space of machine learning and AI and data science. We're really trying to show the fact that these things are meant to augment what people can do, and not replace them. And I think that's a dynamic we have to push as civil society, as people in the space that care about people. That you know, the whole idea around this is not to replace people, but actually what we can do together when these kind of technologies come in. And then I also think the final point I have is to think in five to ten-year time frames. I think one of the biggest things that came both from a donor pressure, from an organizational pressure, from a buzz, from trying to keep momentum was that. Everyone thought things could happen in a year, in six months, in two years. I think like our experience is that where we've been able to dig in and um, really start to work inside a space. You know, you're thinking when it talks about big kind of community complex issues in, t in terms of urban spaces, when you're thinking about government, you really have to think around one to two political cycles at least. And so that's, that's really as, as supporters, as partners, as donors, we need to be thinking in those sorts of spaces. Um, finally, there is a lot of space to find civic tech, and I just wanted to raise it. The Civic Tech Innovation Network has a database on their site. With Treasure, we, do, we developed a tool called Intact, which has a lot of guidelines for mainly aimed at cities, but for how to find and use civic tech and open data. And then there is something called the Civic Tech Field Guide, which is really just a massive resource of civic tech globally, and just encourage you to check that. Um, and so from my side, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, that Thanks. was too long. Um, I have to say, I've, I've struggled to be a good disciplined moderator, um, just based on everyone's fantastic inputs. Um, thanks to all three of our speakers. I thought that was really rich inputs. What I'd like to propose in terms of our way forward um, is that we have very few minutes left in this session, less than five. We had promised to end at 10. So how I would propose we proceed, and I note that we've got questions, is two ways. One, if our speakers are able to stay on and answer any questions, even after some of our attendees have left, we could. We can push it that the max is 10.15. Um, but because we can share the resource and the recording afterwards, it does mean it would still be helpful to anyone who wants to catch the end. So what I propose is that um, we go right into, uh, you know, certainly at least the first, I'm just struggling to actually see the questions. Um, great. So we had um, a question from Isaac, which I think um, came after Al's input, which I will read out. Um, and then a couple of other questions. So what I'd perhaps like to do is, is if we also have them in front of you to each of the speakers, um, we'll actually just, only I think have enough time to, to answer my sense is one question before we end. For those that do need to leave at 10 o'clock, could we please ask, and this is for us to collate some of your own reflections, thoughts and questions, is to please leave your, um, just leave off a key takeaway or a key question or a key thought in the chat box. We will collate and save those um, and try and find a way to, to um, respond and, and add to the session um, because as I said, we're recording it. So that's just to say to anyone who does have to leave at exactly 10, please do that and then just leave us a note. I will impose on our speakers and just force them actually to stay um, at least until 10.15 if that's okay. Well, latest 10.15. So we have a question from Isaac and I think we'll just each time go, try and keep our answers to the speakers quite short. Um, we'll go in the same order that we've spoken. Um, Isaac says, do we see any role of the local philanthropy in internalizing civic tech in our African context? How can we go about this? Um, and if we could just, yeah. The second question, and I think we'll just, if we could answer both as we go, um, is a comment, in fact. Um, I'm trying to scroll down. Then the second is, given donors are moving away, what are new forms of funding for hyper-local civic tech initiatives? I think particularly given um, Al's input. So those two questions, one speaker after the other. Um, uh, this is Al. Um, on the question of, of, of funding, particularly in our context, um, I, I am not aware of, of that much uh, local philanthropy um, that is happening towards civic tech specifically. 
Um, I think the and and this is probably why I'm 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 trying to make a case for us to rebuild faith in civic tech, because of the fact that um, local philanthropists mm -hmm. don't see technology um, or, or, or or civic technology as mm -hmm. as um, a possible solution for for uh, our problems. Our problems are lack of availability of water, lack of seeds for farmers, and so on. How can civic tech solve this problem? So we need to um, turn to uh, local philanthropists and have that conversation. There's a lot of community development organizations and people like that who would benefit from um, civic tech, but who cannot see um, or who cannot connect civic tech and the real life problems um, that um, are, are being so, uh, you know, people are attempting to, to solve. Um, I think the only other thing that I would I would like to comment on is uh, there's a there's a question by the anonymous attendee that asks that you know given that um, majority of technology pro projects fail outright um, and many of them don't show a ROI um, you know is it that we need to be more efficient um, than than that as civic tech. Um, or is it that uh, we need to we need funding that has higher risk appetite? The truth of the matter is, I think it's both. I think uh, civic tech we have a, for us we have a responsibility to be a lot more efficient, and we have a responsibility to try and make sure that our our tools um, have have the impact that that is desired. But also we need to be honest enough to accept that uh, whatever limited um, failures or successes that we have or whatever extreme failures that we, we have, there's not enough um, discussion about the failure of civic tech to solve problems. Um, and therefore that becomes hype because of the fact that then people um, uh, over over emphasize the success and under emphasize the, the the failures or the limitations of civic tech, and as a result, then uh, people don't um, tend to work. Finally, to say that where civic tech, uh, you know, uh, initiatives are concerned, um, it would be valuable when uh, we define or we become clear on what success we are aiming for. A lot of civic tech, um, a lot of civic tech um, ideas tend to go only in so far as to show the problem. So I don't like we, we our civic tech collects data from from uh, from patients that tells the doctor that I don't like your bedside man, but they don't know, they don't go so far as to track whether the doctor changed behavior or what action was taken on the doctor for the doctor to change behavior on his bedside manner. So we need to define what our role is. Are we just a newspaper that um, provides information or are we, um, do we close the loop to all the way into the solution? Thank you very much for having me. Great, thanks so much, Natalie. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, I think the questions were maybe more um, geared at Al, but I can share a little bit more about how SEMA is becoming sustainable or how we're trying to be more sustainable and not just dependent on donors. And I think for us, the key thing was to um, provide value to the government because we were trying to improve public services. So um, although we were also trying to help um citizens and 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 making you know the citizens voice be heard we felt that we should also prove our value to the government so the way we were presenting the data the way we were informing them was such of such value that they were willing to actually start contributing to it so when we got our first government funding for our program that's when donor funding became much more easy because it showed that we were already um, having local buy-in. So when the Ugandan government started co covering, let's say, our expenses of the devices and deployment, um, we could cover our overhead costs uh, with additional donor funds that were much more easy to get at that stage. So of course it's a little bit of a dream for, for a lot of innovations uh, that are working with government, but I do think governments that don't have the capacity to develop good solutions for themselves 
um, could invest in them and, and are starting to invest in them. So in Uganda, there's a ministry of ICT that has actually a big fund for innovations that are being developed locally. So I think that's a really good development. And I hope that that's also happening in other countries around the continent. Um, and the other thing is that we are also providing a solution that could potentially help the private sector. And so we're now exploring partnerships with um, big private sector companies to to provide our devices and our technology and uh, they would then pay um, a fee for our services that would include us to be able to also deploy at public offices. And I think um, we've not tested this yet and our goal is still to improve public service delivery, but if this is a successful pilot with this new private um, company, then that would be a very sustainable model for us as well because it would, always, uh, it would not let us depend too much on donor funding. Um, so yeah, those are two of the kind of ways in which we are trying to become more sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Richard? Okay, um, yeah, so to be quick on this, um, I think in terms of the question around RI um, and just the general point about this, I don't, I mean, I think it's really nice, as it said, to be out of, as someone said, to be out of the hype cycle, to be honest. I think that um, a lot of the things that should have died did die, and some of the things that survived should have are, are now able to become more sustainable and more meaningful. I think it's obviously led to a lot of churn and and that kind of thing. Um, but but and I think in South Africa we've also been slightly behind. I mean maybe our our curve or our um, harp cycle was slightly behind what the one else spoke about. But I just think that it's quite. Um, I'm quite optimistic about the space we're in. It's quite nice to be behind, I mean, you know, at the end of a bubble um, when things start to build up from, from, from sustainability. And I don't think we're at the bottom. I think we're on the way up. Um, so just to be optimistic about it, because I think like a lot of the presentations were focused on some of the challenges we've had. Um, and so I do think that um, we do need a higher, I mean, I think, as I said, I think it's both in terms of higher risk appetites, um, as well as um, being more efficient. I think that maybe some people, especially have been in the space are hurting because we can't be as inefficient as we were able to be before. Um, but I would say that's a good thing. Um, and I would also say that um, what is definitely missing is more openness to experimentation and to feed it into the other one, um, local philanthropy. And to me, that goes back to what I'm talking about, which is when I meet with donors, um, uh, that are local, there is often, and this is really anecdotal because it's only in my experience, but there is often a, a real battle to, to, to convey what civic tech is, what the opportunity is, and how it relates to actual human development factors like clean water, access to water, housing. Um, and so a lot of the work we need to do is to build the capacity, to build the context for donors and there's a lot of work and it is hard and it's frustrating that we aren't in the space where we can go, okay, you know, civic tech and they say, oh yes, and then we go. Um, but I think that, you know, we just as a community need to be trying to put a lot of resources and maybe even collectively into helping make the link between what we do and how it leads to real human outcomes where it does. And that, that is, again, why I go back to literacy and capacity building. It's one of the things, I, it's my biggest sort of point I care about now. Because quite frankly, across the board, whether it's donors or governments or anyone else, what's, what's, what's changed is we had a lot of, as I said, innovation bias and saying, this is a cool thing, come use it. And then the donor space kind of left and a lot of projects failed. And now what we're having to do, which is really good, is go to people and ask them what their problems are and try to meet their problems, meet them where they are, and also realize the context they're in and have to build for that. And so those are two very positive points for sustainability and civic tech and a real impact. Um, so I would say, yeah, to summarize, uh, we do need uh, a more of a space for high risk um, ability to fail. Uh, but the only way we're gonna get there is to educate and build capacity as a community within the people that will support that kind of thing. We also need to take advantage of the fact that we're hopefully outside of, like out, outside of the bubble and now on the more like slower but sustainable upward curve. And we need to build meaningful relationships and, long, and think in the longer term. 
And I think if we start to do that as a community, um, there's quite a lot of hope for the impact we can have. Great. Super, thank you so much for that um, summary, Richard. So you've actually done some of my work, which I can always appreciate. Um, just to say in the last minute or so, unfortunately we won't, I think we have managed to answer the majority of the questions. Um, some had overlaps. Um, and as I said, we'll also try and um, collate and send through, share the presentations and, and resources. In the last um, minute, I think, just to say thank you very much to everyone who joined the call. I think it was fantastic to see the, the participation. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Al, thank you to Natalie and, and Richard. Um, I was expecting a fantastic um, session and got more than that. So thank you for your rich and insightful inputs. Just by way of very quick summary um, wrap up, I think what's evident is that the, the context and the history of civic tech in, in, our, in our continent is rich both from an ins inspirational perspective, but also in terms of disillusionment. Um, and I think we've had a really frank and, and um, open, honest conversation about that and also highlighting the positives. I think we need to, um, one of the things that are a take home message for me is the need to rebuild faith. Like um, uh, Al was saying, in faith in the civic tech, put people first, put people central. I really like the idea of no hype. Um, and I think it goes hand in hand with the issue of scaling in and again, reaching out in terms of literacy and, and building capacity, like Richard was saying, building capacity within um, civil society and, and really owning up to the need to put people more central. The question of citizen feedback that each of our speakers touched on is, is, is very clearly fundamental um, to all our civic tech and the need, as Natalie was saying, to leverage gamification. And I think the examples she shared were, were also quite interesting. Um, also leaning on the more positive aspects of the civil servant, um, civil service. I think we need to think critically about the impact and implications of funding and funding sources. We've had a lot of that and lots of really rich reflections from our speakers. I particularly appreciate at the point that openness does not equal inclusion. And I think um, Richard's reflections on that were, were very helpful as, as were each of our speakers. We need to um, really combat the, ri the, the rise of misinformation. And I think advertising some of our sessions tomorrow, we're going to potentially touch a little bit on that, particularly in the context of COVID-19. Um, so I'd really encourage everyone to join those calls. And lastly, the last two points really is we, we need to be quite realistic about the dynamics of um, you know, privacy, AI, and the factor of discrimination in the context in civic tech. And lastly, that we have what sounds like, what our speakers are saying, is that we have exciting next steps. We have an exciting um, kind of horizon in the, in the context of civic tech, particularly if we take some of these really hard lessons into consideration. Um, and if we begin to leverage the, the questions of what it means to, you know, to look at hyper-local solutions um, and really critically engage with the funding context and what it means to have um, uh, sometimes a heavily donor-driven um, perspective um, and maybe shift that towards a more heavily citizen-oriented um, or citizen-driven um, civic tech environment. So I think while we've had really um, honest, frank reflections that have maybe been um, surprising to some, I think we've also learned a lot in terms of what lies ahead um, and our speakers were very great at, at outlining um, what they've learned in relation to what the civic tech road is. So I for one am quite excited um, about the, the implications for the future and, and very grateful for the session. Thank you to our speakers, thank you to the civic tech innovation team. Um, I think tomorrow's sessions will also be quite exciting. I hope everyone um, is glad to have joined and is not too pained at the extra 13 minutes um, that we stole. Thank you so much, everyone. I think we can end it there. And, and certainly um, I see some fantastic takeaway points, which I think we will collate. Um, yeah, just to read one. Thank you. It was a fruitful conversation. Looking forward to tomorrow's sessions. Um, take care and stay healthy. I like that. Actually, yes, that's a good point to end on. Stay healthy, everyone. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you so awesome. Thank Bye. you everyone. Bye. Nice. <laughs> Thank you so much.